Hey everyone, it's Anthony for PS Blue, and today we've got a top 10 list. The channel's brand new, so I thought it would be a great way for you to get to know the type of games I'm interested in, specifically the PlayStation games that had an impact on my life. This list is totally personal and subjective. I tried to make it not super boring, so I left off some titles that I really love. I tried to shout out 10 different IPs, so there's not 4 God of War games on here. Sorry. This is a pretty diverse list, I think so at least. These aren't necessarily my 10 favorite games, just 10 of the best and most impactful for my childhood and early adulthood specifically. Again, only one game from each IP, otherwise the list would get really boring. It's also important for me to note, there were some games that I played on different consoles that were also on PlayStation, but I thought it would be disingenuous to include them because I didn't play on PlayStation. Let's call these notable mentions. Bioshock, one of my favorite games of all time, I played on Xbox 360. Resident Evil 4, another one of my favorites I had on GameCube. And Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, I played on N64, even though it was a huge hit on PS1. Okay, with all that out of the way, here's my top 10 PlayStation games. Number 10, Guitar Hero 2 for the PS2. You ever play a game that's so different, the intrigue of it consumes your life? Well, that's what happened to me with Guitar Hero 2. Looking back at it, this might not seem like a top 10 game, and I almost kept it off the list, but I just couldn't. And that's because I spent hundreds of hours playing Guitar Hero 2, working my way up to expert difficulty, beating every single song. I was waking up in the morning and immediately turning on my PS2 to play this peripheral-based game. It might seem like a gimmick today, but in 2006 this game was more popular than ever and super innovative. Tilting the guitar to activate star power while playing the solo to Freebird is a memory I'll never forget. This game was the pinnacle of peripheral-based rhythm games, a genre that is probably too dated to return at this point. But at the time, there was nothing else like it. Number 9, Spyro the Dragon for the PS1. Now, I'll be honest, I never finished the first Spyro until the remasters came out. That was mainly because I was very young and still an inexperienced gamer. However, that doesn't mean the game didn't impact me in an incredible way. This is for sure the game that sold me on PlayStation. It was one of the first PlayStation games I ever played and holds a huge piece of nostalgia in my heart. I still remember holding that controller for the first time. I had joysticks, which was a huge deal by the way. Riding in the hot air balloon, that sense of discovery when reaching a new area. Also, the feeling of breaking the original dragon statues has nothing on the remaster. Although I love all three of those games as well. The blue apple running around with the dragon egg also led to my first rage quit ever. I highly recommend checking out the Trilogy Remaster. It's usually pretty cheap, and if you have any interest in Insomniac, it'd be fun to check out their first Smash hit. Important to note that the remaster was made by Toys for Bob, but obviously Insomniac's DNA is all over it, as it basically is a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Number 8, It Takes Two for the PS5. This game is unbelievable and criminally underrated. It is, by a considerable margin, the best co-op game I've ever played. I played this locally with my girlfriend on PS5 and we were both blown away. Other than a pretty anticlimactic ending, the game is pretty much perfect. It touches on almost every genre in gaming history and does so brilliantly. Normally I'm not a fan of the kitchen sink approach, but if you made a full length game out of any of these vignettes, they would hold up in the respective genres. Take this example, the top down ARPG thing that they do, my girlfriend and I both wanted a full length version. We both think it could give Diablo 3 a run for its money. The graphics are phenomenal on PS5, and the game runs at a crisp frame rate. The integration of co-op challenges is perfect. Without coordination, you can't beat most levels. I don't want to talk too much about this game because it'll take up the whole video. Maybe I'll do that soon. Just please, everyone buy this game so we get a sequel. Number 7, Little Big Planet, PS3. This is another game best enjoyed with friends. I'm more keen on single player games at the moment, but during the PS3 era, I was pretty much a multiplayer only gamer. Little Big Planet is the sole reason my cousin and I bought a PS3. You see, during the 360 PS3 era, Microsoft caught me in their grasp. I was an Xbox Live, Halo 3, Call of Duty 4 player, and so was he. This all changed when we saw the first stage demo of Little Big Planet. As two creatives, we were astounded. It was something that we had to have. When we finally got our Christmas PS3s and copies of Little Big Planet, after fighting with the PSN for hours upon agonizing hours, we managed to connect, creating memories we'd keep forever. I think the Sackboy LBP property is going in a completely different direction now, for better or worse, but in 2008, this game was a creator's dream, no pun intended. It was a playground where you could make literally anything you wanted in a 2D platform space. We laughed out loud as we used our cameras to put pictures of our family members in the game and referencing inside jokes for a good laugh and some rewarding platforming. 
The single player campaign fed off of your need to create as well. The more levels you completed, the more rewards you obtained for create mode. It was an addictive loop. Yes, the platforming was and still is a bit floaty, but once you get used to it, the campaign is a blast. Still haven't picked up dreams yet, even though I'm very curious. Number six, Crash 4. I know, I know, this game is multi-platform and the original PlayStation exclusive Naughty Dog games make more sense for a PlayStation list, but, but, this is my favorite Crash game. Sorry, Naughty Dog. Toys for Bob absolutely knocks it out of the park with Crash 4. The platforming is snappy and precise. The game does all the little things right. You could tell it was made by gamers and fans of the series. Simple things such as the yellow circle so you know where you're going to land, or the villains chiming in through voice memos really add up to create a handcrafted experience. And the major changes, such as the different masks, are also implemented so well. I thought the game would be good after playing the demo. I had no idea how great it would be. The difficulty ramps up perfectly throughout. I love a challenging platformer, going all the way back to the early Donkey Kong Country days. In this respect, Crash 4 definitely delivers. The mask power-ups never seem like a gimmick. They are there to add challenge and variety to the levels. By the end of the game, you're dealing with all the masks in the same level, which creates some of the most hectic, difficult platforming challenges I've ever completed. There's tons of bonus levels and content, additional characters and replayability that ensures you are getting what you pay for here. Again, buy this game, I desperately want a Crash 5. Number 5, Uncharted 2. So after setting down LBP for a little while, I picked up a game that changed my perception of video games forever. This game was Uncharted 2. For the first time in my life, I realized that video games can maybe one day compete with movies. More specifically, Uncharted 2 is an action game that could definitely compete with an action movie. I think there's more variety here than some films and even some action franchises. The opening level has you hanging from a bus that has fallen over a mountain, scaling it to escape death by fractions of seconds. The combat in the game is great. The story is well told and acted expertly. For the first time in gaming, production value can be used as a valid qualifier. The set pieces in this game are historic and set the stage for so many games to follow. The Last of Us, the Tomb Raider series, Horizon, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, surely the upcoming Indiana Jones game. None of these games would happen without Uncharted 2, and this is why it makes my top 5. Number 4, Jack 2. From one Naughty Dog IP to another, to another. Do you see a pattern here? Jack and Daxter, the first game in the series, might objectively be the best. However, Jack 2 is my personal favorite. I wasn't really into Grand Theft Auto at the time, but this game was an action-adventure alternative to it. Jack goes from silent G-rated hero to PG-13 borderline campy anti-hero. He steals hovercrafts, has an attitude, and totally appeals to the preteen rebel in me. The gunplay is fast and fun. The enemies are varied and interesting. The world is deep, and the story is put together well. The mission variety is also awesome, varying from puzzles, to platforming, to defeating tough waves of enemies. This game is probably higher on my list than most, but it has a special place in my memories. I played it recently, and I have to say it definitely holds up. I genuinely think this is a great game. When it's on sale, give it a shot. Just don't expect anything like the first in the series. Number 3, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Spoiler alert for later in the list, but Kingdom Hearts is one of my favorite franchises of all time. So when Kingdom Hearts 3 came out, I knew it could never live up to the hype, but boy did it fall short. It was so disappointing. However, the same team that worked on Kingdom Hearts 3 was also working on an obscure game they never really talked about, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Frame rate issues aside, the combat is the best Nomura has ever delivered. It takes the best parts about Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy XV and seamlessly combines them with a modernized take on the original innovative combat of Final Fantasy VII. Switching between different characters' playstyles and pausing combat to coordinate the perfect combo of abilities is absolute magic. And you need to coordinate properly in this one. The game's difficulty is perfect. I actually died several times on my first playthrough. Now, that might not seem like a big deal on the surface, but that was my biggest complaint with both Final Fantasy XV and Kingdom Hearts 3. The games are so f***ing easy. All the stakes of the story are completely invalidated by the trivial difficulty in each game. I thought Final Fantasy XV had a great story. To be honest, it's the only thing that pushed me through to the end. But all the climactic battles fell super flat because I never had to worry about dying. My choices in combat had no weight and no meaning. Kingdom Hearts 3 suffers greatly for the same reasons. 
This is not the case at all in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Every choice you make has a consequence in battle. And although the story is very linear, which I think is a positive, it makes you more invested in the combat decisions you make. I am so excited for part two of this game. Number two, Kingdom Hearts. Okay, so at this point you probably knew this was coming. Kingdom Hearts, up until very recently, was my favorite PlayStation game of all time. As a matter of fact, it might be my favorite video game, period. It's not number one in this list for a very specific reason that we'll get into, but it is still my favorite video game ever. It's the game that made me love video games. It's the first game I was obsessed with, and it came out in a time in my life where escaping was important, and boy, was this an easy game to escape to. It combines my favorite childhood memories of Disney with a genre of game I later found out was also my favorite, the action RPG. The combat was intriguing and the story wasn't convoluted yet. It was a lot easier to follow when there was just one game. There are so many moments in this game that resonate with me every time, even after 300 plus hours and 10 plus playthroughs. For example, going from being on your own to meeting Donald and Goofy for the first time. This is so great. It's so fascinating. Nothing about this game should work, but it does. Adding Tarzan to your party for the first time. Wow, this is actually Tarzan from the movie. We are actually fighting Clayton from the movie. The actual Donald Duck, a beloved icon, is fighting with you and not casting cure when you need it. Seriously, fuck you, Donald. No knockoffs, no fakes, but the real deal. Square Enix, one of the best RPG studios ever, was actually producing a game with Disney. This game combined two of my fondest childhood memories, video games and Disney movies, and made something that didn't suck. That alone is an accomplishment. But not only did the game not suck, it was really, really good. The combat had a real challenge and sense of progression. The story, again, was a lot less confusing at the time. The game was very hard and extremely rewarding, especially for a kid. It had some of the best Disney IPs in it as well. Hercules, Tarzan, Peter Pan, even Nightmare Before Christmas. Kingdom Hearts 1 will almost definitely always be my favorite game ever because of what it means to me personally. However, what is the game that I consider to be the best PlayStation game of all time? The game that is shifting the medium in a completely new direction? The most important game PlayStation has ever produced. Okay, let's get my boring number one PlayStation game ever out of the way. That's right, it's God of War 2018. I went chalk here, and I'll tell you why. This game is revolutionary for the medium. Not only is it the most important PlayStation game ever made, it is the most important video game produced since Super Mario 64, which came out about 25 years ago. Here's why. God of War is a better cinematic experience than most movies that came out in 2018. I don't know if I'd be saying that in 2019, which was a historic year for film, but that's beside the point. The way this game seamlessly combines both elements of cinema with conventions of gaming is nothing short of amazing. First of all, the story is told in one single shot, something that most movies that try fail to achieve. The result is an unbroken storytelling experience that feels like one singular moment of time. This creates an increased sense of urgency and a more realistic sense of real-time storytelling. And it's not done just to be cool. It truly adds to the story. Next, the way that Kratos' relationship with Atreus parallels their efficiency in combat, well, I've never seen something so effective in video game storytelling. Atreus starts off as the kid that tags along, a burden, if you will. But, as the story progresses, he becomes more important to Kratos, and in turn, more important to the combat. Without giving anything away, as the two strengthen their relationship, their interconnectedness in combat becomes vital to survive. In the story, Atreus starts off as the little kid Kratos must babysit, and to be honest, he doesn't do much in combat. But by the end, Atreus is incredibly important to Kratos, and the two have had several breakthroughs in their relationship. As a result, Atreus becomes a character you couldn't live without, both in combat and in story. On a more surface level analysis, the game is beautiful, the acting is some of the best I've seen in games, and the story is written to near perfection. In short, this game is more than an interactive movie, and it is more than a game. It's a vessel through which a story is told. The best version of the story isn't told in the gameplay alone, and it wouldn't be best told in a movie. The best version of the story is exactly how it was delivered in 2018. Storytelling is the future of gaming. God of War has opened my eyes and shown me 
and the rest of the world that gaming can become a powerhouse medium with which we tell our stories. Yes, there are other examples of this, The Last of Us, Heavy Rain, Mass Effect, and so on. However, in my opinion, all of these games could be told in a movie, in a book, or in a television series. God of War could not. The way the player grows to love Atreus in tandem with Kratos is a novel idea that couldn't be replicated in a movie. This game is huge for the industry. A deeper dive on this still to come. If you made it this far, thank you. I really appreciate your interest in the channel. If you enjoyed any part of the video, show some support however you'd like. Until then, welcome to PS Blue and stay tuned for new videos every week.